King George and the Prince of Wales visit the battleship New York. In the background, British patrols leave to the North Sea. On the quarter deck of the flagship, Left to right, Admiral Beatty, Admiral Rodman, the King, Admiral Sims, and the Prince of Wales. volunteers are cheered down Fifth Avenue. And along the piers, an endless chain of these young recruits march into transports, thousands of them and millions more to follow. The German liner Fatherland is seized in a dex jam with khaki-clad warriors bound for the battlefields of France. The first wave of Americans. And in Washington, the draft is invoked, calling out millions of men. Here is the lottery of a draft. President Wilson draws the first number. Vice President Marshall draws the second. There are five million names before it is finished. And from the Atlantic seaboard, America's second wave starts for Europe. Transports, now camouflaged as a protection against submarines, depart loaded to the gunwale with fresh manpower. Naval cruisers and destroyers will escort the troop ships. There are Red Cross nurses. And YMCA workers. And below decks, there is chow, for those who wish or feel like it. And a little pal from home. Lookouts, submarines, gun crews stand by, ready for action. A torpedo is sighted, heading for transport. Deck guns on swift destroyers go into action. From the stern, depth charges are released and Y-guns are specially constructed for anti-submarine warfare throw charges of TNT far to each side. The U-boat commander has missed his target, and the troop ships continue their long haul across the stormy Atlantic. In June 1917, the first American troops reached France. The Germans did not believe it possible. And the Yanks leave for Paris. The Americans have arrived. They cheered as only the Fidet to Lafayette. The French are wild with joy. At last, French can cheer. Flowers are thrown beneath their feet. And in London, for the first time in history, American soldiers march through the streets of the British capital. From the balcony, Ambassador Walter Hines Page and Admiral Sims look down, filled with pride. The two English-speaking nations are united. At Buckingham Palace, they are received by the King, his mother, and Lord French.
Queen Mother, Widow King Edward, and Plumier Lloyd George. The Kremlin in Moscow is the heart of Russia. Who holds it holds the Russian people. Tsar Nicholas II holds it in 1917, and these are the last pictures of this unhappy man and his family. Beside him is little Alexis, his son and heir. Behind him are his four daughters, grand duchesses, and in the background, his wife, the Tsarina. They are reviewing a Cossack regiment drawn up within the palace grounds for the last time. The little Tsar an invalid from birth, is afflicted with an incurable disease. But his sufferings will soon end. The Zion army fights on. These Cossacks have marched thousands of miles across snow-clad plains. They boast the greatest endurance of any soldiers. They will die by the thousands in the frozen trenches of Russia. In the villages behind the lines, people are starving. There is talk of revolution. Wounded soldiers returning from the front listen and think, why should they fight? At the front, troops begin to mutiny. The army stops fighting. They will go home and divide up the land, kill those who stand in their way. In Moscow, Kerensky heads a new government. It endures six months. Then come the ten days that shake the world. The masses take charge of their destiny. With rifle, bayonet, machine gun, the Bolsheviks seize power. Parades are held. These banners say, join the Bolshevist. The new era is here. Bodies of nameless heroes are given little parades. And the 300-year-old Romanov dynasty ends. An empire is trampled down. Trotsky harangues the troops. Later, he is banished, and the Red Army is born. It is drawn up in Moscow's Red Square. Its commander, Trotsky, takes the salute. That winter, great famine spreads throughout Russia. The American Red Cross feeds millions, and still millions die. In Moscow, the Kremlin is covered with snow, and behind its walls is Lenin, who heads the new order. His wife foresaw this great revolution. She'll be called Lenin, the seer, the incorruptible prophet, the father of Bolshevism. Back in France, the Prince of Wales is awaiting his mother. Queen Mary of England visits the front for the first time. She's accompanied by the king. At British headquarters, King Albert and Queen Elizabeth of the Belgians meet them. And on the sand dunes nearby, King George decorates heroes. The bravest of these are the Belgians. The little Belgian princess, Marie Jose, will marry the Italian crown prince. The slender lad will rule Belgium. King George and Sir Douglas Haig meet the President of France, Marshal Joffre, and General Fush to confer. Non, ma petite, il est là, je suis Joffre, Monsieur le Président. Ah, merci beaucoup, tu es très gentil. These great men will discuss unity of command for the Allies. 
king for the first time is informal before a camera. 